Yo, how are we today? Good, man. My name is Charlie. I'm the senior pastor. We haven't met. I hang out down here after the service. Come and say hi. We're going to dig in quick today. Uh, one thing we do a rhythm at CBC is I firmly believe that the gospel fights against culture most of the time in most cultures it's found itself in because the values of God are large part different than the values of most society the gospel's flourished in. And so not unlike any other culture in time, I think our culture values things the gospel doesn't. And one of the biggest things I think we value is criticalness. <laughs> and so we're trained from a young age to look at something and then tear it apart. And now people get online and make money off that. And let me tell you something, the gospel is all about seeing where God is moving and asking him to move in us, through us, so that societies might be changed. It starts with the individual and moves out to uh, the world at large. And so we start every Sunday before the service, before the sermon, and we simply say a prayer that invites us to lose our critical spirit for the sake of pride and simply ask the question, where is God moving this morning? Because he is. Because we're going to open his scripture. Because that's how he reveals himself. Because we worship together, we get to see the goodness of God. And if we don't see it, it's probably not the problem of God. It's probably the problem of us. And we want to pray that we see God this morning. So I'm just going to lead us in a prayer. You can join in when I give you a prompt that we might see God moving this morning and it might move us. Let's pray. God, I'm thankful for who you are, that you're worthy of worship, that the move of the Spirit is inward before it becomes outward. I pray this morning, Holy Spirit, that you move in our spirit, that you show us a, a God that's worthy of worship, that, that only um, wants us to focus on him for the next little bit of time so that we might be changed into the image of Jesus and bring the influence of God into our world. If, if you're comfortable, just take a few seconds and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your spirit this morning. I ask you to pray for me that as we talk about wisdom today and foolishness and the working of God in our world, uh, that my words might make sense, that we might see a picture of a God who's worthy of worship, and that we might leave this place seeing a more active God than when we came into this place. Praise the in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. I am what's known as an old millennial. You guys know what that is? Have you heard that before? Um, so an old millennial, there's old and young millennials, and it kind of changes how you see the world. And usually there's three different differentiators between old and young millennial. Old millennials had three things happen to them. One is you remember where you were when 9-11 happened. Two is that you graduated college pre the recession of 2008. And three is you remember a time and space in your childhood when you weren't consistently connected online. So like my first cell phone growing up, I was 16 and I had a bag phone. You know what that is. It was a phone in a bag you plugged into your car. And my twin brother and I would trade off to see who gets it that evening because nobody wanted it because then your parents could contact you. Those were the days, everybody. <laughs> All right? I think a fourth uh, litmus should be added. A couple of years ago, my wife, who I think is a young millennial, said, hey, have you seen Harry Potter? I said, no, and she was blown away. And so we started a thing every Friday where we started watching through the Harry Potter series, and I realized it's a really big deal for people that aren't old millennials. If you're a little younger, there's a cult following that people used to stand in line outside of Barnes and Nobles and other bookstores the night before and wait. They'd get the books at 2 a.m., and then they'd come home, and they'd read them all that night. Amazing. This last week, somebody passed me a note about the author, J.K. Rowling, and it fascinated me. In between the third and fourth book, so stories still going on, not resolved yet, she used to get on chat sites back when that was a thing, and she used to pose as just a fan of Harry Potter. And you know what happened to her? She got skewered by Harry Potter fanatics. She'd give some kind of like small opinion, and her words really bland, and all these Harry Potter sycophants would get on there and basically say, you don't know what you're talking about. You've clearly never read the books. You need to leave us. And she's being interviewed, and she's like, man, I, I kind of know what I'm talking about a little bit, you know? And I bring that up to say this. We're in this series in Matthew in between chapter 12 and 13, and that's kind of where we find ourselves. Today's a little different. We're not going to walk through the first couple verses of 13 and, and exegete three verses in the next 45 minutes per the huge here. We're going to look back a little bit. 
Because what's happening in our text is extremely important. It's about to change, shift tones, where Jesus goes from speaking out loud and pretty clearly about his kingdom to now all of a sudden he's going to speak in code because there's more opposition and his time at the cross isn't coming yet. People had completely missed who he was and he's staring at them, you know? Very much the same thing, like we're in a chat room with the writer of the book and you don't realize who it is. We spend a lot of money in this country trying to find God. We really do. In 2017, there was a study done by Georgetown and the museum. First of its kind, I'll quote a bit about it. It it took an empirical look at the value of faith, the economics of faith. How much is faith worth to us and how much do we spend? If you want to say it another way, how much do we spend in trying to find God? And it quoted from all sorts of different religions. So it's 236 religious sects from Christian denominations to Muslims to Hindu to Jewish to Buddhist. It it encompassed 345,000 congregations across the United States, and it found that religion is worth anywhere between 1.2 trillion to 4.8 trillion in monetary value to the U.S. economy. We go in, we go, we go a long way to try and find God in this country. My 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 posit for today, my question for today, where I'm going today is simply: I wonder sometimes if it's like the chat room, and he's looking us in the face, and we miss it, because they did in Matthew 12. God's working in their world and they're too foolish to see it. And Jesus talks about it and and, and in the epistles, they look back and they talk about it. There's this verse in 1 Corinthians 1 that popped to mind is throughout the the reading of chapter 12 for me. Jews demanded signs and Greeks searched for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. It goes on to say, those who are called Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. I think why chapter 12 in Matthew weighs on me, it's about a people that wanted nothing more than to see God. And we miss that sometimes. We think the Pharisees are the bad guy in our culture of villain and hero. They wanted nothing more than to see God. And he's standing right in front of them, and they couldn't. Man, that breaks my heart, you know? Because I wonder how and in what ways we do the exact same thing. I think, I think when Paul talks about it in Corinthians or Jesus talks about it throughout the Gospels, especially as things are heating up in Matthew, he talks about it as foolishness. And for our definition today, foolishness is, is simply failing to see God at work or failing to work within the wisdom of God in your life when it's presented to you. And so here's what I want to do this morning is I want to look back at chapter 12 a bit and I want to look at how they were foolish. I want to look at how we're foolish. And when we find where we're foolish, hopefully then we can see a more clear picture of where God's working because we see it. But in order to do that, we have to start with this biblical definition of, of foolishness. And you might think foolishness is just dumbness. It is very much not dumbness. Foolishness is not about intellect at all. It doesn't care about how many degrees you have or how many times you've read through the Bible, or how many Beth Moore studies or anybody else that I like studies you've done on Right Now Media. Foolishness is not an intellectual capacity. It's a way you choose to see the world. It's not about how smart you are. It's about the system you choose to vie into or believe in. One author says it must always be remembered that Proverbs, when it talks about foolishness, the book on wisdom and foolishness, has in mind a man's chosen outlook rather than his mental equipment. And what that means for you and me is you can be the smartest guy in the room and still be foolish. And sometimes we think, well, I'm really smart. I can't be foolish. You know what the foolish man was in the Bible? Solomon. You know who the smartest man was in the Bible? Solomon. He asked for wisdom. People came from, in chapter 12, you saw it. The queen of Sheba came a couple thousand miles just to check into this guy's wisdom. But he also knew the one command that was given to Israel when they got their land was don't intermarry. Don't intermarry, not because God doesn't like other people, not Jewish. He very much does. It's the story of the Bible. They said don't intermarry because if you marry people that don't love your God, you won't love your God as much. It's the one command he gave. You know what Solomon did? He took on 700 wives that didn't love his God. You know what happened? It blew up his country, you know? That was a smart, stupid man, yeah? And so what it does is it shows us that you can be smart and foolish at the same time. My question this morning is simply for all of us to ask, where are we being foolish? Because it's when we recognize our foolishness that we can rid it from our lives and get a fuller, clearer picture of who God is. I love what the author, Albert Hubbard, says. He says, every man is a fool for at least five minutes a day. Wisdom consists in not exceeding that limit, (laughs) you know? Mark Twain says this, I was young and foolish, now I'm old and foolisher. (laughs) So really, today is kind of a stop point when we reflect on what just happened before we get to this new tonal shift in Matthew 13, and we ask the question, where are we missing God because we're foolish? And what does that look like? 
Where as a people of faith have we maybe not seen God at work in our world because we can't see beyond ourselves? And so what we're going to do is go to Proverbs 1. It's the best verse I know about foolishness. And we're going to look at three different kinds of fools that's laid out in the proverb. And we're going to ask the question, where am I this one? And where am I this one? And where am I this one? Because foolishness is not binary. You are smart and foolish at the same time. And my, my hope and my prayer and my goal this morning is that we reflect and as we ask questions, we recognize and rid ourselves of foolishness, not because we want to be wise people, because we want to see God better because we want to live into his ways more. And hopefully through the three categories we get to, we get to a space where because we put language behind them, it allows us to recognize them. I am doing some premarital counseling for a couple. It's getting married in May, and last week was conflict and, and communication week. And I just remembered the first time that somebody broke down what conflict and communication looked like when I was doing premarital 10, 11 years ago. And somebody said the words for the first time, negative interpretation. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, like they know me, you know? And what that allowed me to do was actually recognize that pattern in my life. And then every time I saw it, every time my wife saw it, she could tell me, <laughs> I said that wrong, excuse me. Uh, no, but it's true. Every time she saw it, she said, hey, this is happening. Now you have a language for it. Uh, Romans 6 talks about this with sin in the law. It says, you know what the law was good for? It didn't invent sin, but the law gave us now a, a title for sin. So now when you do this thing that's intrinsically bad, you have a name for it, so then you can stop doing it. So what this does today, as we look through three different kinds of fool in Proverbs, it allows us to name it, to recognize and rid ourselves of foolishness so that, again, we can see more of God. So our verse this morning is going to be in Proverbs 1.22. It'll be up on the screen. I'm going to liken back a lot to Matthew 12 because, again, it's kind of a weighing on me how I've seen it in there. And as we dive into these three different kinds of fools, hopefully it can help us in our conversation about how we miss and how we see God. Proverbs 1.22. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Three different words for fools there that's used throughout Proverbs in this one Proverbs. You have the simple, you have the mockers, and you have the fools. We're going to deal with all of them because they have different motivations behind any of them, but between them all. First one is, how long will you who are simple love your simple ways? That idea of simple there is uh, kind of defined as the not yet fully foolish fool, if you want to call it something like that. When it says simple, it doesn't mean dumb. Simple in the Proverbs, it's used about 14, 15 times. It's, 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 it's meaning someone who hasn't yet decided to choose the way of wisdom. It's meaning someone who's foolish because they have not put a plan together about how to be wise in their life. They're just kind of hanging out. I'll give you a verse to prove it. In uh, Proverbs uh, 119, flog a scorner, and as a result, the simpleton will learn prudence correct the discerning person, and as a result, he will understand knowledge. So there's this idea in Proverbs that there's this beginning of foolishness, this battleground for wisdom and foolishness. The scriptures call it simple, where you haven't yet decided what you're going to do yet. And in that moment, the angel and demon on your shoulders are battling for your decision. Saying, hey, do you not know yet which way to go? And if you don't, that's a problem. The Bible calls that simple. All through Matthew 12, you can look at it. And I think verse 15, it says, and all the crowds followed Jesus. But then you skip down to verse 35 and 36, and he warns him. And he says, hey, after I die, none of you are going to follow me. Because they yet hadn't made a decision on who Jesus was. They yet hadn't made a decision on the veracity of his claims, on the goodness of God. They were just hanging out and watching what he did, but didn't move them to make a decision yet on who he was. And when the Proverbs talk about the simple, there's a word picture. It's like a door left wide open, you know? And we all know the problem with a door left wide open. My, my kiddos are uh, very, very pale, and they don't like things that are summer, but they love to swim. And so I didn't realize this. When I get bit by a mosquito, I get bit by a mosquito, you swat it, it itches. There was one time this summer, this last year, when my son got bit by a mosquito because I left the door open, I'm I'm sure. And uh, it looked like he had a baseball on the side of his head. And then I had to take him to daycare. (laughs) I I had nothing to do with this. They look at you kind of side-eyed, you know? And and so when the, the Bible paints a picture of simple being a door wide open, really what it's saying is now you'll let anything you want in without any kind of discernment over whether it's good or bad. When you leave the door open, you can let some bad things in. Look, this isn't saying that we need to be uh, overly zealous on how we guard things. It is saying that we need to use biblical discernment, you know? Uh, the Proverbs says it like this in fourteen fifteen: The simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thoughts to its steps. You know, I'm sure you guys have heard it, but do you know that, that that true news and false news travel at very different speeds. You guys know that? 
couple years ago, MIT did a study on Twitter, and they found out of 126,000 claims or rumors um, over 11 years that the false rumors on Twitter uh, traveled six times as fast as truth claims. I'm going to quote, accurate stories rarely reach more than 1,000 people, yet the most prominent false news items routinely reach between 1,000 and 100,000 people. They said false news stories are 70% more likely to be retweeted than true stories. And then they followed that up. And they said, by actual people, not bots. So let's not blame it on technology, everybody. We are simple people that accept things, you know? He goes on to say, quote, we found that falsehood diffuses, uh, diffuses significantly farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly than truth in all categories of information and in many cases by an order of magnitude. The Bible would say that if you're a simple person, you leave the door of your heart, mind, will, emotion, soul wide open and anything can come in and seem like it's true for you. As a people that follow Jesus, we're called to be judgmental and discerning, not in a way that you think about when you hear judgmental. But, but if we don't value the claims of Christ and then if we don't line them up to the personality of God and the character of God that we see in the scripture, we don't value God. If somebody would say something negative about my wife that isn't true and I don't defend it, how much do I love my wife? And we defend it with grace and with love and with conviction. We're not jerks. But I think our job is to move beyond the simple and say, hey, it matters what comes in our house. But then also it's not just about what comes in the house. I mean, you guys have been there in the summer when you leave a door open and your parents, and now that I'm a parent, do you notice how when you're a parent, you just say the, that, that, that commercial, you say the parenting phrases, you become your parents, whether you want to or not? And so like my kids will leave the door open and for some reason I say the phrase that I've never said before, close the door, do you want to air condition the whole neighborhood? That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> I, I, I disliked that so much growing up and now I say it all the time and then I have to do a deep dive and what kind of man am I really becoming? You know, I just... So it's not just about being simple what comes in, it's about what goes out again you see this with most of the crowds in Matthew 12, is they initially accepted Jesus but didn't do anything with it. And by the end of it, Jesus is saying, when I'm gone, that's a demon language in 35 and 37, when I'm gone, um, the things that are gonna fill you is gonna be bad. And so he's saying, don't be simple about how you see me. Don't be simple uh, uh, about how you pursue um, the kingdom of God. Use discernment and discretion in all you do. The simple haven't yet made up their minds to follow, and that's a problem because they don't have a plan of attack for when bad things happen. Because here's what I know. I know if you haven't decided that God is good when bad things happen, you won't believe it then. I know that if you haven't decided that God is unchanging and God is gracious and God is loving and God is kindness, when you get through real hard things in life, you'll blame God for the bad things and not the bad world that's broken because of us for the bad things. I know if we haven't decided beyond a simple way of knowing that God is my deliverer, then we won't believe it when I need to be delivered in the moment. And that's exactly what happened to most of the Jewish community and population. They were simple. And so because they were simple, they could not see a clear picture of who God is. And in chapter 12, Jesus deals with that. And I think in verses 40, 41 and 42, he basically says to him, man, you know how many people uh, recognize the goodness of God before you. He likes it to the Ninevites, and I said the queen of Sheba. She came from near, far, and wide to find the value in Jesus. And he says, I'm standing right in front of you. Something better than Solomon is here, and you don't see it. And so if we talk about how we're gonna find and see more of Jesus and recognize and rid our foolishness, it begins by asking the question, where, oh, where, oh, where are we simple in our lives? Or we simply haven't decided that God is good that he's a deliverer, that he's a savior? Where are those areas of our life that we haven't let God into because we're afraid, because we don't know, because we're lazy? And so if we're gonna see more of God, we push past the simple, the next kind of fool. How long will you who are simple love the simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? We'll do with the word fools next. It's the least egregious of the three, uh, the, the, the next level of egregious of the three. That word fool... It's the one most commonly associated in Proverbs. It's seen over 60 times. It literally means the stubbornly proud and the proudly stubborn. Um, I think we all know this, these people. They're all the Fox News pundits and CS, MSNBC pundits on TV. They are all the people that comment on things in life instead of live life. You know what I'm talking about? When we talk about the fool in terms of knowledge, they hate knowledge, meaning they cannot see outside of themselves. Proverbs 12 says it like this. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes. As a, wide man, a wise man listens to advice. The second kind of fool we see are those people in our lives, or those people in the biblical lives that literally are too dense to see outside of themselves. The Hebrew here paints a word picture of being thick or fat. 
Like it's so thick and so fat that it can't, knowledge can't penetrate. Again, my kids are uh, very, very pale, and summer's coming for all of us. I am olive-skinned. I didn't wear sunscreen growing up because God is gracious. And uh, one of my things I still don't understand, my wife is a little on the pale side too, and, and we have like, the time to put sunscreen on before we go swimming in my house is just way, way too long for me. And I remember new kids coming on the way, we got a bathing suit this week, and you know now that we not only put sunscreen on kids, but now there's SPF levels to clothing? Yeah, it's the world we live in right now. I had no idea. I thought all clothing were all SPFs. They're not. So I'm going to lather my kids up in 1,000 SPF and then throw on a, a full body you know, shirt and, and nothing's going to get through. Not, the, the sun has no chance to burn my kids. This is the picture that's painted in the Proverbs of the Fool. Like no matter how hard you try, they're so dense and they're so thick that they hate knowledge so much that they will never, ever, ever hear or see what God is doing. In chapter 12 of Matthew, the Pharisees saw God heal. They saw him right there. And they said, man, this can't be God. This has got to be demonic. There was no amount of truth that can make them believe, that they can make them stop believing what they thought was true in the first place. It's what we said a couple weeks ago. Uh, when reality clashes with our deepest convictions, we'd rather recalibrate reality than amend our worldview. So the second kind of fool that we find when we're trying to see God more clearly are the parts when we could not be wrong. Tim Keller says it like this, we're naturally obstinate and unwise. In Proverbs 18, it says, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. You guys, pitchers and catchers reported, I'm a baseball fan. You guys ever seen the movie Bull Durham? Yeah, yeah, it's rated R, so okay, let's take that. This is not like, hey, fun family Friday this, Charlie. The pastor said it, no. Uh, it's a baseball movie. <laughs> uh, and uh, there's a scene that's one of my favorites. This young kid who thinks he knows everything, and he's a really talented pitcher gets up on the mound with this double A, and you got this old catcher that's never going to get to the big leagues, but he's wise. And so this pitcher says, I'm just going to throw fastballs. That's what I throw. You probably know how this goes. And the catcher says, don't throw a fastball. Anyway, long story short, he throws a fastball, and it gets taken over the left field wall, hits this big bull, and, you know, the thing. And, uh, and, and, and the whole point of that is that this young kid could not be convinced that he didn't know it all, and at the end, he suffered the consequences of that. And this is the picture that it paints in Proverbs when it talks about the fool, those people who are so convinced of their own rightness that they'll never be confronted with their own wrongness. Let's go back to the J.K. Rowling story. She's talking about this forum. And you know what she said stuck out to her? She said what stuck out is from page one of her books, it's about anti-bullying. It's about treating people with dignity and respect regardless of whether they're like a full wizard or a half wizard or come from a good family or a bad family. She said, from the first page of my books, it's, it's against like the meanness and the cruelty that can come from people. And she said, the irony was I'm in this chat room and they're doing to me exactly what I'm saying don't do in my books. They loved my stuff so much they'd forgotten the things that my stuff loved in the first place. Jesus is walking around healing people giving sight to the blind, a messianic act we talked about a few weeks ago. And they love God so much they've forgotten what God loves, you know? I think far too often we fall into the same camp where we think we know God so much better than we actually do because we're unwilling to listen and to hear. And again, there needs to be discretion and discernment. We need to make sure that, that what we're doing lines up with the character of God. But the foolish can't see wisdom because they can't see past themselves. That's what the proverb says. This is what the Pharisees were doing. So often we're sure, we're sure, we're sure of how God works that we can't see any way around how we already think God is working. That is the narrative of the Israelites. I remember several years ago, somebody dropped off a pamphlet at CBC. And uh, basically it was this like dire warning of here's all the people that are gonna lead you astray in terms of theological you know, astuteness. And the names on this pamphlet were amazing. It was like Daryl Bach, and it was like some, some really heavy hitters, and the, like DTS was one of the first ones they listed. And I think as with staff, we read it, and I said to myself, if all these people are wrong, <laughs> then maybe I don't want to be right. It's this idea that if I can look at the world and everybody's wrong but me, you probably should look in the mirror a little more than you do. So the second question I have when we talk about foolishness and our ability to see God is, how often are we allowing others to expand our view of who God is? How often are we allowing others to show us where God's working in ways that we might not see, recognize, or realize? Because, man, if that's not happening, then maybe we're not seeing a full picture of what God is doing. Maybe we're 
too quick to judge and less quick to stop and say, well, is this thing of God in the first place? There's a story in Acts chapter 5 after Jesus rises. And it's a, the lead rabbi at the time, the lead Pharisee, excuse me, named Gamaliel. And, and they come and they say, hey, this Jesus movement is gaining traction. And he's the only one that stops. He says, let's wait. If this is of God, we can't stop it. And let's see. It's that depiction that maybe God's working outside of my expectations and that's good for me to see. And if I don't, I'm foolish. The third kind of fool we see is the scoffers. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? These are the contagious critics, you know? This is all throughout. As the conversation of Jesus is growing, as his fame is growing, as his claims so, towards deity are growing a little bit. What you have is this more and more concerted groups of Pharisees in particular that try to spread falsities about God. They just, they can't be won over. Everything he does is negative and wrong. It's like the hard heart and Pharaoh in Exodus. You remember that story? When God can do amazing things, but because you've already made your mind up, you haven't seen it. And what does? Every time Jesus does something beautiful and good, it makes them angry, you know? They're not just neutral, they're angry uh, about it. This term is used about 17 times in the book. It's this idea that there's no way that any good could come from this person or this place. And here's the problem with uh, mockers is it's contagious to you and me. It's contagious and only leads to destruction. Proverbs 24 says, the devising of folly is sin and a scoffer is an abomination to mankind. Because when we're critical in this capacity, when we're critical, it only leads to a place that doesn't see God because we're too focused on the criticalness of what's happening in the moment, you know? That's literally why we pray before we start every sermon at CBC that the move of the Spirit is inward to conviction, not outward to critique. Do you know why we pray that? Because I need that. A couple years ago, uh, I think when somebody on staff stopped me and they said, Charlie, you have to change your face after you preach. And I said, thanks, cool. Uh, let's talk your salary and benefits next one-on-one. -on -one. Um, no, but I, if you, I'm working on this. I'm, I'm, I am intrinsically critical, especially inwardly. And so I, after sermons, I will walk off stage and I'll sit right over here. And I have to work on not looking angry at myself because I'm playing all the things I should have said differently, you know? And they looked at me and they said, man, you just look angry. And I said, I am angry. And they said, that's not okay. <laughs> and I said, oh, you got a point, don't you? <laughs> you know? It's this idea that when we're critical, it's contagious and it just grows. And we don't stop and ask where God is moving and how God is moving and what God is doing. Tim Keller says, habitual mocking will harden you and poison your relationships. We live in a critical society and the problem with criticalness is it only leads to one place. It only leads to destruction of our belief in the hope of humanity and, and what God is doing. And so uh, we, we pretend like being critical is a sport and that it's good for us, but oftentimes the desire behind our critical nature is not good for us. It's only going to rip us down. It's only going to drive us into a place that's worse and worse and worse. That's why the proverb says in verse 22, drive out a scoffer and strife will go out and quarreling and abuse will cease. It says there's only one way to deal with these kind of foo fools. Get them out of your community because it spreads and grows. And so this morning, our conversation it's about how we recognize and rid ourselves of foolishness so that we can see a better, bigger, whole picture of how God is moving. Because, man, between chapter 12 and 13, these whole group of people missed it, and my heart's broken for them. Because I'll go deep, wide, and far to find where God is moving in the world. I want to take away the places where I don't see it because I'm foolish so that I might see a clearer picture of who God is. I'll give you one more proverb this morning. Proverbs 26. It's better for a uh, person to meet a mother bear being robbed of her cubs than to encounter a fool in his folly. I like to think of myself as a backpacker and a camper. I'm not. I've been once. Um, <laughs> I'm just being honest. <laughs> but I go to Lowe's all the time, and I think that I'm a DIY guy. Um, <laughs> so... I remember a couple years ago, before I started that part of my life, I was talking to a friend of mine who lived in Colorado, and he was telling me about this verse. And he said, do you know what that means? I said, yeah, it means that it's just not good to find a fool in his folly because if you see a bear, it's pretty scary. He said, that's not what it means. He said, literally in Colorado, if you see a bear, especially if you see um, a, a grizzly bear's cubs, he says, you're a dead person. And I said, excuse me? And he said, if you see 
a grizzly bear's cubs, you're already dead, you just don't know it yet. And I said, how does that work? He said, the mother's around, the mother's there, and you're dead. You just, and then I did research online, that was a dark hole that I got down, you know? <laughs> and it turns out, like if you see a, I'd rather see a grizzly bear than her cubs, because if you see a grizzly bear's cubs, the mom knows you're there and she's coming for you. It is terrifying everybody, you know? So what the Proverbs means here, what it writes is the idea behind it. It's not just scary, bad, mad, or sad. If you run a fool into his folly or find mockers or simpletons or foolish people, what he's literally saying is if you're foolish, you don't see the life of Jesus, you only will, it only will end up result in death. So what it does is it takes this pursuit of wisdom, it takes this recognize and rid the the folly in my life to another level because I want to see God working in my world. Because I think that's the job of the church, is to come alongside one another in a culture that doesn't value what the scriptures value and say, do you know who God is and do you see him working all the time because he is and because he does? There's different models of church, you know? And one of them that you're probably familiar with is the seeker motto where you come and it's a little more watered down, not in a terrible way. I'm not critiquing it. Uh, That would be ironic right now. Um, (laughs) But one of my favorites is a model that basically thinks Sunday mornings are, are, are more for our people and less for the people that aren't our people because it's for our people that already know and love Jesus to come together and hear stories about how God is still good in the middle of a world that forgets that. That hear stories about how God is worth pursuit in a world that tries to get you to worship all the other things. Like our job on Sunday is to come together to equip the saints so that we might go out and battle the world that needs the light and love of Jesus come here every Sunday morning for an hour and 15 minutes and to worship like we've never worshiped before and to hear stories about how God is good and to be reminded in a world where it seems like darkness is winning that light will always overcome. That's the role and job of the church is to come together and say it's foolish if you don't see God working in a world. Let me give you three places this week where I've seen it, I've heard it, and I've experienced it. Because sometimes like the Pharisees and all of the Jewish people and us, we forget. Because man, in our culture, we spend a lot of money trying to find God. And so this morning, very simple job, simply to get us to ask the question, where are we simple, where are we foolish, where are we uh, scoffing at God's work in our world? Because when we ask those questions, when we recognize those spaces and places, we can more fully begin to see a God at work. Because that's what they missed in Matthew 12. And next week, we're going to dive back into 13 and talk about how we don't hear the message of the gospel before we get into some parables. But it's good enough to stop down and ask the question, where are we fools? Because then we don't fully see God. And I want to be a church that fully sees God. I want to be a church that recognizes where he's, where he's working in my world so that I can latch onto it and say he's good. And sometimes I need help. And so very simple marching orders this week. Get with somebody else you know and love that knows and loves you and ask the question, where have you seen God working in my world? Where have I missed it? Because we need others in this pursuit. Where have you seen God working? And then where has God worked in your world so that I can know and see it? And we can then be the church that that moves away from foolishness and towards wisdom, that moves away from the places and spaces that don't think God is active and realizes that he is and he's winning. We can see God in the moment when he's staring us in the face and saying, oh yeah, there you are. You're not somewhere else. Because that's our job. I'm in this place right now. Yesterday, my family and I went to the Arboretum because we're trying to do as many things as we can in the family of four before what I've heard, my life gets exponentially harder. Uh, and we ran into a friend of ours, and, and he just had his third kid, and we haven't seen their family in a while. And I said, uh, hey, how is going from two to three? And you know what he said? It was very sweet. He said, it's way, way, way tougher. And I said, oh, <laughs> this has been encouraging. Um, we're sitting there and on this lawn, and kids are running around everywhere, and it's a beautiful moment. And I, I, just, I just thought to myself, you know what? If I don't see the beauty in this moment, then I don't recognize what God is doing in my family. It's so easy to get bogged down by all the worries and the cares and the, uh, just, just the chaosness of toddlerness, you know? But I miss the present active God in our world. One of my favorite magazines is called Delayed Gratification. It's a magazine that practices what's called slow journalism. Slow journalism, literally, it publishes a magazine three months after anything happens to reflect on it three months later, not in the moment. And I think that in a society that very quickly assesses good and bad and very quickly moves from one thing to another and in that we miss a lot of what God is doing, today, today is a week when we go from Matthew 12 to 13 and the tone shifts to stop down and ask the question, where is God moving in my world and where have I missed it? Because I've been foolish. 
Because when we fully rid and recognize our foolishness, we fully see a God who's active in our world. We see Jesus standing in front of us saying, I'm healing, saying I'm here, saying I'm suffering, saying I'm going to die for you, but in the end to provide you more than you ever have before. I'm your hope. And my hope and prayer is that we don't miss that as a church like the Pharisees did. My hope is we can fully see God and we fully rid ourselves of foolishness. And I need your help in the process. So this week, let's have that conversation. Let me pray for you. God, I, man, I want to be a people that recognize the work of Jesus in our midst when it's happening. And as I read through the scriptures, I, I see a tragedy of people that just miss it time and time and time again. And it's worth stopping down and reflecting and asking, where am I doing the same thing? So Holy Spirit, this week I ask that you show us profoundly where you're active in our life. That you use other people to speak into our life where we've seen God move so that we might have confidence in the Jesus standing in front of us and the Holy Spirit working in our midst. So we might have confidence knowing full and well what the kingdom of God is that we're going to unpack in the next few weeks. That we might know fully that our God is acting and he's winning. We might see the works of the Lord and rightly ascribe them to him. And that gets us excited. So we worship the God who's bigger than us and better than us and needed by us. We might not be foolish, foolish, but see a really full picture of Jesus. So Holy Spirit, move in us this week to do that so that we might show people that God is good. I pray these things in his name. Amen.